thank you for that very kind introduction and thank you for having me at this amazing conference in such a good venue. So um, I would like to talk about T-Wave inversion in athletes and when to worry. Let's start by defining T-Wave inversion as more than at least one millimeter in depth in two or more contiguous leads, excluding AVR3 and V1. And this can be territorial. So anterior T-Wave inversion defined as T-Wave inversion in, in V2 to V4. Inferior T-Wave inversion in leads 2 and AVF that can sometimes include limb lead 3. And lateral T-Wave inversion, not just V5 and or V6, but also the higher limb leads of one and AVL. And of course, we can get combinations of the two, anterolateral T-wave inversion and infralateral T-wave inversion. So when is it OK to demonstrate antero, uh, anterior T-wave inversion? And there have been a number of papers. And as Michael said, we are slightly older now, but yes. we have shown that there are demographic and um, um, exercise induced disciplines that can demonstrate more T-wave inversion that has deemed a normal variant amongst, for example, black, black athletes. We showed that female athletes demonstrate T-wave inversion as a normal phenomenon if confined to V1 and V2. Endurance athletes, one in 10 endurance athletes have been shown to show T-wave inversion in the anterior leads and adolescent athletes as well. But there is a new guard and we do um, now um, have data from other populations, not just European white and black um, cohorts. And uh, Thaya Garajan took over 48,000 military male recruits from Singapore and showed that the prevalence of anterior T-wave invasion was in fact just 0.3%. That's much smaller than what we have been reporting. Moreover, out of these um, uh, people with anterior T-wave inversion, many of them demonstrated a normal transthoracic echocardiogram, but 2.3% were actually diagnosed with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And of those who did have persistent anterior T-wave inversion, a subsequent seven were diagnosed with further disease on cardiac MRI. And that just goes to show that in a more diverse population, mainly Chinese, Malay, Indian, anterior T-wave invasion wasn't necessarily considered a totally benign ECG pattern. Depths of over uh, of less than two millimeters were associated with a 100% negative predictive value for myocardial disorders. But it just goes on to um, emphasize what Professor Carrado was saying about the importance of ongoing evaluation and we can't just simply dismiss everything we see as a normal variant. However, this is an ECG for 23 year old black athlete who demonstrates anterior T wave inversion confined to V1 to V3 and this has been deemed normal with J point elevation, a convex ST segment. This is rarely found in isolation in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients and not usually associated with other forms of cardiomyopathy. It's deemed an, eth an ethnically related innocent bystander finding. And that's what Michael showed is present as a normal um, uh, ECG pattern in up to 13% of black athletes. What about this 15 year old tennis player without any symptoms who has anterior T-wave inversion? Well, this is deemed a juvenile pattern and we are well versed in the data to show that the prevalence of anterior T-wave inversion falls by from about 10% to less than 0.2%. But Again, a graduate of the MSc Sports Cardiology Programme, Mark Abella, showed in the BTIT study in a different population in Malta, he took nearly 3,000 15-year-olds who were half male and half female and showed that isolated anterior T-wave inversion was present in 5% of them, more so in females than males, and deep T-wave inversion was present more in males. But the, the prevalence fell to just 0.2% after the age of 16. So this juvenile pattern has been replicated very recently. This was just a few months ago. But we should worry when we do come across certain features, for example, a flat J point or an isoelectric ST segment preceding the anterior T wave invasion that extends beyond V2 to in fact V4. And Professor Corrado has shown that actually in athletes with the J point elevation of more than one millimeter and T wave inversion that doesn't extend beyond V4, that there's an excellent sensitivity to exclude cardiomyopathy. But 
if there is J-point depression, if there's delayed upstroke of the S wave, if there is an epsilon wave preceding the ST segment, if there is T-wave inversion extending beyond V4 to so the lateral leads, and if there is ectopy suggestive of um, a, 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 a right ventricular um, uh, origin, or if we have small amplitude QRS complexes, these are all red flags when considering anterior T-wave inversion. So if you're not of black ethnicity and you demonstrate this pattern, if you're over the age of 16, if your J-point is not elevated, and if there is concomitant ST segment changes, then you should look for other features of arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. And from the more recent data shown, even the depth of the T-wave. What's about lateral T-wave inversion? Now, as it stands, this is pathognomic of cardiomyopathy present in the majority of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients and has been shown to be more common in black individuals and rare in white individuals. So lateral T-wave inversion has been shown to be associated with the disease, so much so that Nabil Sheikh took 100 patients, athletes with anterior T-wave inversion, 21 of whom were diagnosed with a clinical disorder, and all black athletes and the majority of white athletes with a cardiac disorder had lateral T-wave inversion, giving a diagnostic yield of 56% in white and 18% in black athletes, and 12% did have a gene associated with their underlying cardiac disorder. So T-wave inversion in the lateral lead should not be ignored, and it should, uh, certainly should not be ignored when it is more widespread, i.e. in those infralateral territories. Frederick Schnell took 155 athletes with deep T-wave inversion in the inferior and or lateral leads. And he showed in this more cross-sectional study that the overall yield for cardiomyopathy or myocarditis was 45%. So infralateral T-wave inversion should not be ignored. So we know lateral T-wave inversion is associated with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. We have anterior T-wave inversion with other pathognomic features on the ECG associated with ARVC. But the jury is still out with respect to inferior T-wave inversion. And according to the um, original ESC guidelines, if you have inferior T-wave inversion in two contiguous leads, then that was deemed um, necessary to further investigate. But the international recommendations are a bit more pragmatic. And in order to try to reduce the false positive rate, they deemed two contiguous leads as a normal variant, but would only investigate if three leads are involved. Um, the limitations of this trade-off between false negatives and false positives highlighted by this case, where this was a footballer with inferior T-wave inversion that wouldn't necessarily have warranted further evaluation purely from the inferior lead territory, demonstrating T-wave inversion in limb leads 3 and AVF, but not so much so in lead 2. However, three years later, you can see that he has all three territories involved and some non-specific lateral T-wave inversion flattening as well. So it's not just looking at one territory in isolation. So infralateral T-wave inversion does warrant follow-up. Other markers of disease are important, as I mentioned, including ST segment depression, T-waves or ectopy, particularly in the context of T-wave inversion, when it's more subtle to actually say, yes, this is definitely T-wave inversion. So they don't have to look around the ECG for other markers of disease. And ST segment depression is defined as greater than 0.5 millimetres in depth in two continuous leads and is a marker of cardiomyopathy, particularly hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, mm -hmm. and should always be considered abnormal. So T-wave inversion is a marker of cardiomyopathy in inferior contiguous leads and or lateral leads. It always warrants follow-up. In anterior leads beyond V2, it's abnormal in those over the age of 60 and in non-black athletes, and one should look for other accompanying pathological ECG changes. I, we've heard so eloquently from Professor Corrado about the need for serial evaluation, but something to highlight is the evolution of T-wave inversion. It isn't just a one-off phenomenon, and any T-wave inversion that is observed should be compared to previous ECGs of an individual. And this is important because we're entering an era of precision medicine with athletes from a diverse background, um, 
originally, historically, the recommendations have been based purely on black and white athletes. We know about mixed race athletes now as a cohort. We know, as I've demonstrated, about Far East athletes. And the world is becoming a much smaller place. And I think we need more ethnicity specific targeted recommendations and further validation of T-wave inversion is required amongst these emerging ethnic groups. The depth of the T-wave inversion needs to be considered, particularly if deep more than two millimeters and other markers should be considered. And longitudinal evaluation of T-wave inversion is required, also accounting for the aforementioned demographic factors. And I'm involved in a MRC funded project to evaluate 16 year old. Well, they are now 30 year olds, but 15 years ago, they demonstrated T-wave inversion in the context of a structurally normal heart. So we're re-evaluating these guys to see who has developed a T-wave inversion um, and, and who has developed a cardiomyopathy as a result of that T-wave inversion with the overarching aim to build a predictive model in order to inform the individuals, their doctors, their families as to when a cardiomyopathy may manifest. And that's got important implications when advising with respect to sporting participation. Thank you very much for your attention.